Chapter 8 of The Terror, A Mystery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jenny Clements. The Terror by Arthur Machen. What Mr. Merritt Found. Mr. Merritt began to pick up his health and spirits a good deal. For the first morning or two of his stay at the doctor's, he contented himself with a very comfortable deck chair close to the house, where he sat under the shade of an old mulberry tree beside his wife and watched the bright sunshine on the green lawns, on the creamy crests of the waves, on the headlands of that glorious coast, purple even from afar, with the imperial glow of the heather on the white farmhouses gleaming in the sunlight, high over the sea, far from any turmoil, from any troubling of men. The sun was hot, but the wind breathed all the while gently, incessantly, from the east, and Merritt, who had come to this quiet place not only from dismay, but from the stifling and oily airs of the smoky midland town, said that this east wind, pure and clear, and like well water from the rock, was new life to him. He ate a capital dinner at the end of his first day at Porth, and took rosy views. As to what they had been talking about the night before, he said to Lewis, No doubt there must be trouble of some sort, and perhaps bad trouble. Still, Kitchener would soon put it all right. So things went on very well. Merritt began to stroll about the garden, which was full of the comfortable spaces, groves, and surprises that only country gardens know. To the right of one of the terraces he found an arbor or summer house covered with white roses, and he was as pleased as if he had discovered the pole. He spent a whole day there, smoking, lounging, and reading a rubbishy sensational story, and declared that the Devonshire roses had taken many years off his age. Then on the other side of the garden there was a filbert grove that he had never explored on any of his former visits, and again there was a find. Deep in the shadow of the filberts was a bubbling well, issuing from rocks and all manner of green, dewy ferns growing about it and above it, and an angelica springing beside it. Merritt knelt on his knees and hollowed his hand and drank the well water. He said, over his port, that night that if all the water were like the water of the filbert well, the world would turn to teetotalism. It takes a townsman to relish the manifold and exquisite joys of the country. It was not till he had begun to venture abroad that Merritt found that something was lacking of the old rich peace that used to dwell in Marion. He had a favorite walk, which he never neglected year after year. This walk led along the cliffs towards Miros, and then one could turn inland and return to Porth by deep winding lanes that went over the Alt. So Merritt set out early one morning and got as far as a sentry box at the foot of the path that led up to the cliff. There was a sentry pacing up and down in front of the box, and he called on Merritt to produce his pass or to turn back to the main road. Merritt was a good deal put out and asked the doctor about this strict guard, and the doctor was surprised. "'I didn't know they had put their bar up there,' he said. "'I suppose it's wise. We are certainly in the far west here. Still, the Germans might slip round and raid us and do a lot of damage just because Marion is the last place we should expect them to go for.' "'But there are no fortifications, surely on the cliff?' "'Oh, no, I never heard of anything of the kind there.' "'Well, what's the point of forbidding the public to go on the cliff, then?' I can quite understand putting a sentry on top to keep a lookout for the enemy. What I don't understand is a sentry at the bottom, who can't keep a lookout for anything, as he can't see the sea. And why warn the public off the cliffs? I couldn't facilitate a German landing by standing on Pingareg, even if I wanted to. It is curious, the doctor agreed. Some military reasons, I suppose. He let the matter drop, perhaps because the matter did not affect him. People who live in the country all year round, country doctors certainly, are little given to desultory walking in search of the picturesque. Lewis had no suspicion that sentries whose object was equally obscure were being dotted all over the country. There was a sentry, for example, by the quarry at La Hafangal, where the dead woman and the dead sheep had been found some weeks before. The path by the quarry was used a good deal, and its closing would have inconvenienced the people of the neighborhood very considerably. But the sentry had his box by the side of the track, and had his orders to keep everybody strictly to the path, as if the quarry was a secret fort. It was not known till a month or two ago that one of these sentries was himself a victim of the terror. The men on duty at this place were given certain very strict orders, which from the nature of the case must have seemed to them unreasonable. For old soldiers, orders are orders. But here was a young bank clerk, scarcely in training for a couple of months, who had not begun to appreciate the necessity of hard, literal obedience to an order which seemed to him meaningless. He found himself on a remote and lonely hillside, he had not the faintest notion that his every movement was watched, and he disobeyed a certain instruction that had been given him. The post was found deserted by the relief. The sentry's dead body was found at the bottom of the quarry. 
This, by the way, for Mr. Merritt discovered again and again that things happened to hamper his walks and his wanderings. Two or three miles from Porth, there is a great marsh made by the Elfon River before it falls into the sea, and here Merritt had been accustomed to botanize mildly. He had learned pretty accurately the causeways of solid ground that led to the sea of swamp and ooze and soft yielding soil, and he set out one hot afternoon determined to make a thorough exploration of the marsh, and this time to find that rare bog bean that he felt for sure must grow somewhere in its wide extent. He got into the by-road that skirts the marsh, and to the gate which he had always used for entrance. There was the scene as he had known it always, the rich growth of reeds and flags and rushes, the mild black cattle grazing on the islands of firm turf, the scented procession of the meadow sweet, the royal glory of the loose strife, flaming pennons, crimson and golden of the giant dock. But they were bringing out a dead man's body through the gate. A laboring man was holding open the gate on the marsh. Merritt, horrified, spoke to him and asked who it was and how it had happened. They do say he was a visitor at Porth. Somehow he had been drowned in the marsh, whatever. But it's perfectly safe. I've been all over it a dozen times. Well, indeed, we did always think so. If he did slip by accident, like, and fall into the water, it was not so deep. It was easy enough to climb out again. And this gentleman was quite young to look at him, poor man. And he has come to Marion for his pleasure and holiday and found his death in it. Did he do it on purpose? Is it suicide? They say he had no reasons to do that. Here the sergeant of police in charge of the party interposed, according to orders which he himself did not understand. A terrible thing, sir, to be sure, and a sad pity, and I am sure this is not the sort of sight you have come to see down in Marion this beautiful summer. So don't you think, sir, that it would have been more pleasant-like if you would leave us to the sad business of ours? I have heard many gentlemen staying in Porth say that there is nothing to beat the view from the hill over there, not in the whole of Wales. Everyone is polite in Marion, but somehow Merritt understood that, in English, the speech meant, move on. Merritt moved back to Porth. He was not in the humor for any idle, pleasurable strolling after so dreadful a meeting with death. He made some inquiries in the town about the dead man, but nothing seemed known of him. It was said that he had been on his honeymoon, that he had been staying at the Porth Castle Hotel, but the people of the hotel declared that they had never heard of such a person. Merritt got the local paper at the end of the week. There was not a word of, in it of any fatal accident in the marsh. He met the sergeant of police in the street. That officer touched his helmet with the utmost politeness in the, Hope you are enjoying yourself, sir. Indeed, you do look a lot better already. But as to the poor man who was found drowned or stifled in the marsh, he knew nothing. The next day Merritt made up his mind to go to the marsh to see whether he could find anything to account for so strange a death. What he found was a man with an armlet standing by the gate. The armlet had the letters CW on it, which are understood to mean Coast Watcher. The watcher said he had strict instructions to keep everybody away from the marsh. Why? He didn't know. But some said that the river was changing its course since the new railway embankment was built, and the marsh had become dangerous to people who didn't know it thoroughly. Indeed, sir, he added, it is part of my orders not to set foot on the other side of that gate myself, not for one scraggend of a minute. Merrick glanced over the gate incredulously. The marsh looked as it always had. There was plenty of sound, hard ground to walk on. He could see the track that he used to follow as firm as ever. He did not believe in the story of the changing course of the river, and Lewis said he had never heard of anything of the kind. But Merritt had put the question in the middle of general conversation. He had not led up to it from any discussion of the death in the marsh, and so the doctor was taken unawares. If he had known of the conversation in Merritt's mind between the alleged changing of the Alphonse course and the tragical event in the marsh, no doubt he would have confirmed the official explanation. He was, above all things, anxious to prevent his sister and her husband from finding out that the invisible hand of terror that ruled at Midlingham was ruling also in Marion. Lewis himself had little doubt that the man who has found dead in the marsh had been struck down by the secret agency, whatever it was, that had already accomplished so much of evil. But it was a chief part of the terror that no one knew for certain that this or that particular event was to be ascribed to it. People do occasionally fall over cliffs through their own carelessness, and as the case of Garcia the Spanish sailor showed, cottagers and their wives and children are now and then the victims of savage and purposeless violence. Lewis had never wandered about the marsh himself, but Remnant had pottered around it and about it and declared that the man who met his death there, his name was never known, in Porth at all events, must either have committed suicide by deliberately lying prone in the ooze and stifling himself, or else must have been held down in it. There were no details available, so it was clear that the authorities had classified this death with the others. 
Still, the man might have committed suicide, or he might have had a sudden seizure and fallen in the slimy water face down, and so on. It was possible to believe that case A or B or C was in the category of ordinary accidents or ordinary crimes, but it was not possible to believe that A and B and C were all in that category, and thus it was to the end, and thus it is now. We know that the terror reigned and how it reigned, but there were many dreadful events ascribed to its rule, about which there must always be room for doubt. For example, there was the case of the Marianne, the rowing boat which came to grief in so strange a manner, almost under Merritt's eyes. In my opinion, he was quite wrong in associating the sorry fate of the boat and her occupants with a system of signaling by flashlights, which he detected, or thought he detected, on the afternoon in which the Marianne was capsized. I believe his signaling theory to be all nonsense, in spite of the naturalized German governess who was lodging with her employers in the suspected house. But on the other hand, there is no doubt in my own mind that the boat was overturned and those in it drowned by the work of the terror. End of chapter 8chapter nine of the terror a mystery this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jenny clements the terror by arthur machin the light on the water let it be noted carefully that so far merritt had not the slightest suspicion that the terror of middlingham was quick over marion lewis had watched and shepherded him carefully he had let out no suspicion of what had happened in Marion, and before taking his brother-in-law to the club, he had passed round a hint among the members. He did not tell the truth about Middlingham, and here again is a point of interest that as the terror deepened, the general public cooperated voluntarily, and one would say almost subconsciously with the authorities in concealing what they knew from one another. But he gave out a desirable portion of the truth, that his brother-in-law was nervy, not by any means up to the mark, and that it was therefore desirable that he should be spared of the knowledge of the intolerable and tragic mysteries which were being enacted all about them. "'He knows about that poor fellow who is found in the marsh,' said Lewis, "'and he has a kind of vague suspicion that there is something out of the common about the case, but no more than that.' "'A clear case of suggested or rather commanded suicide,' said Lemnett. "'I regard it as a strong confirmation of my theory.' "'Perhaps so,' said the doctor, dreading lest he might have to hear about the Z-ray all over again. "'But please don't let anything out to him. I want him to get built up thoroughly before he goes back to Middlingham.' Then, on the other hand, Merritt was still as death about the doings of the Midlands. He hated to think of them, much more to speak of them. And thus, as I say, he and the men at the Porth Club kept their secrets from one another. And thus, from the beginning to the end of the terror, the links were not drawn together. In many cases, no doubt— a and b met every day and talked familiarly it may be confidentially on other matters of all sorts each having in his possession half of the truth which he concealed from the other so the two halves were never put together to make a whole merritt as the doctor guessed had a kind of uneasy feeling it scarcely amounted to a suspicion as to the business of the marsh chiefly because he thought the official talk about the railway embankment and the course of the river rank nonsense but finding that nothing more happened, he let the matter drop from his mind and settled himself down to enjoy his holiday. He found to his delight that there were no sentries or watchers to hinder him from the approach to Larnack Bay, a delicious cove, a place where the ash grove and the green meadow and the glistening bracken sloped gently down to red rocks and firm yellow sands. Merritt remembered a rock that formed a comfortable seat, and here he established himself of a golden afternoon and gazed at the blue of the sea and the crimson bastions and bays of the coast as it bent inward to Sarnau, and swept out again southward to the odd-shaped promontory called the Dragon's Head. Merritt gazed on, amused by the antics of the porpoises, who were tumbling and splashing and gamboling a little way out at sea, charmed by the pure and radiant air that was so different from the oily smoke that often stood for heaven at Middlingham, and charmed, too, by the white farmhouses dotted here and there on the heights of the curving coast. Then he noticed a little rowboat at about two hundred yards from the shore. There were two or three people aboard, he could not quite make out how many, and they seemed to be doing something with a line. They were no doubt fishing, and Merritt, who disliked fish, wondered how people could spoil such an afternoon, such a sea, such pellucid and radiant air by trying to catch white, flabby, offensive, evil-smelling creatures that would be excessively nasty when cooked. He puzzled over this problem and turned away from it, to the contemplation of the crimson headlands. And then he says that he noticed that signaling was going on, 
flashing lights of intense brilliance, he declares, were coming from one of those farms on the heights of the coast. It was as if white fire was sprouting from it. Merritt was certain, as the light appeared and disappeared, that some message was being sent, and he regretted that he knew nothing of heliography. Three short flashes, a long and very brilliant flash, then two short flashes. Marriott fumbled in his pocket for pencil and paper so that he might record these signals, and bringing his eyes down to the sea level, he became aware, with amazement and horror, that the boat had disappeared. All that he could see was some vague, dark object far to the westward, running out with the tide. Now it is certain, unfortunately, that the Marianne was capsized, and that two schoolboys and the sailor in charge were drowned. The bones of the boat were found amongst the rocks far along the coast, and the three bodies were also washed ashore. The sailor could not swim at all, the boys only a little, and it needs an exceptionally fine swimmer to fight against the outward suck of the tide as it rushes past Pennegreg Point. But I have no belief whatever in Marriott's theory. He held, and still holds for all I know, that the flashes of light which he saw coming from Pennier Hall, the farmhouse, oh, the height, had some connection with the disaster to the Marianne. When it was ascertained that a family were spending their summer at the farm, and that the governess was a German, though a long naturalized German, Merritt could not see that there was anything left to argue about, though there might be more details to discover. But in my opinion, all this was a mere mare's nest. The flashes of brilliant light were caused, no doubt, by the sun lighting up one window of the farmhouse after the other. Still, Merritt was convinced from the very first, even before the damning circumstance of the German governess was brought to light, and on the evening of the disaster as Lewis and he sat together after dinner, he was endeavouring to put what he called the common sense of the matter to the doctor. "'If you hear a shot,' said Merritt, "'and you see a man fall, you know pretty well what killed him.' There was a flutter of wild wings in the room. A great moth beat to and fro and dashed itself madly against the ceiling, the walls, the glass bookcase. Then a sputtering sound, a momentary dimming of the lamp. The moth had succeeded in its mysterious quest. "'Can you tell me,' said Lewis, as if he were answering Merritt, "'why moths rush into the flame?' Lewis had put his question as to the strange habits of the common moth to Merritt with the deliberate intent of closing the debate on death by heliograph. The query was suggested, of course, by the incident of the moth and the lamp, and Lewis thought that he had said, Oh, shut up, in somewhat elegant manner. And in fact, Merritt looked dignified, remained silent, and helped himself to port. That was the end that the doctor had desired. He had no doubt in his own mind that the affair of the Marianne was but one more item in the long account of horrors that grew larger almost with every day, and he was in no humor to listen to wild and futile theories as to the manner in which the disaster had been accomplished. Here was a proof that the terror that there was upon them was mighty, not only by the land, but on the waters, for Lewis could not see that the boat had could have been attacked by any ordinary means of destruction. From Merritt's story it must have been in shallow water. The shore of Larnock Bay shows very gradually and the admiralty chart showed the depth of water two hundred yards out to be only two fathoms. This would be too shallow for a submarine, and it could not have been shelled, and it could not have been torpedoed. There was no explosion. The disaster might have been due to carelessness. Boys, he considered, will play the fool anywhere, even in a boat. But he did not think so. A sailor would have stopped them, and it may be mentioned that the two boys were, as a matter of fact, extremely steady, sensible young fellows, not in the least likely to play foolish tricks of any kind. Lewis was immersed in these reflections, having successfully silenced his brother-in-law. He was trying in vain to find some clue to the horrible enigma. The Middlingham theory of a concealed German force, hiding in places under the earth, was extravagant enough, and yet it seemed the only solution that approached plausibility. But then again, even a subterranean German host would hardly account for this wreckage of a boat, floating on a calm sea, and then what of the tree with the burning in it that had appeared in the garden there a few weeks ago, and the cloud with the burning in it that had shone over the trees of the Midland village? I think I have already written something of the probable emotions of the mathematician, confronted suddenly with an undoubted two-sided triangle. I said, if I remember, that he would be forced, in decency, to go mad, and I believe that Lewis was very near to this point. He felt himself confronted with an intolerable problem that most instantly demanded solution, and yet, with the same breath, as it were, denied the possibility of there being any solution. People were being killed in an inscrutable manner, by some inscrutable means, day after day, and one asked why and how, and there seemed no answer. In the Midlands, where every kind of mutinotment was manufactured, the explanation of German agency was plausible, and even if the subterranean notion was to be rejected as savouring altogether too much of the fairy tale, 
or rather of the sensational romance, yet it was possible that the backbone of the theory was true. The Germans might have planted their agents in some way or another in the midst of our factories, but here in Marion, what serious effect could be produced by the casual and indiscriminate slaughter of a couple of schoolboys in a boat, of a harmless holiday-maker in a marsh? The creation of an atmosphere of terror and dismay. It was possible, of course, but it hardly seemed tolerable, in spite of the enormities of Louvain and of Lustiania. Into these meditations and into the still dignified silence of merit broke the rap on the door of Lewis's man, and those words which harass the ease of the country doctor when he tries to take any ease. You're wanted in the surgery, if you please, sir. Lewis bustled out and appeared no more that night. The doctor had been summoned to a little hamlet on the outskirts of Porth, separated from it by a half a mile or three quarters of the road. One dignifies indeed the settlement without a name and calling it a hamlet. It was a mere row of four cottages, built about a hundred years ago for the accommodation of the workers in a quarry, long since disused. In one of these cottages the doctor found a father and mother weeping and crying out to Dr. Bach, Dr. Bach, and two frightened children and one little body, still and dead. It was the youngest of the three, little Johnny, and he was dead. The doctor found that the child had been asphyxiated. He felt the clothes. They were dry. It was not a case of drowning. He looked at the neck. There was no mark of strangling. He asked the father how it had happened, and father and mother, weeping most lamentably, declared that they had no knowledge of how their child had been killed. And let it was the people that had done it. The Celtic fairies were still malignant. Lewis asked what had happened that evening. Where had the child been? Was he with his brother and sister? Don't they know anything about it? Reduced into some sort of order from its original, piteous confusion, this is the story that the doctor gathered. All three children had been well and happy through the day. They had walked in with the mother, Mrs. Roberts, to Porth, on a marketing expedition in the afternoon. They had returned to the cottage, had had their tea, and afterwards played about on the road in front of the house. John Roberts had come home somewhat late from his work, and it was after dusk when the family sat down to supper. Supper over, the three children went out again to play with other children from the cottage next door, Mrs. Roberts telling them that they might have half an hour before going to bed. The two mothers came to the cottage gates at the same moment and called out to their children to come along and be quick about it. The two small families had been playing on the strip of turf across the road, just by the stile into the fields. The children ran across the road, all of them except Johnny Roberts. His brother Willie said that just as their mother called them, he heard Johnny cry out, Oh, what's that beautiful shiny thing over the stile? End of chapter 9《Chapter Ten of the Terror A Mystery》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joy Baker. The Terror by Arthur Machen. Chapter Ten The Child and the Moth. The little Roberts ran across the road, up the path, and into the lighted room. Then they noticed that Johnny had not followed them. Mrs. Roberts was doing something in the back kitchen, and Mr. Roberts had gone out to the shed to bring in some sticks for the next morning's fire. Mrs. Roberts heard the children run in and went on with her work. The children whispered to one another that Johnny would catch it when their mother came out of the back room and found him missing, but they expected he would run in through the open door any minute. But six or seven, perhaps ten minutes passed, and there was no Johnny. Then the father and mother came into the kitchen together and saw that their little boy was not there. They thought it was some small piece of mischief, that the two other children had hidden the boy somewhere in the room, in the big cupboard, perhaps. "'What have you done with him, then?' said Mrs. Roberts. "'Come out, you little rascal, directly in a minute!' There was no little rascal to come out, and Margaret Roberts, the girl, said that Johnny had not come across the road with them. He must still be playing all by himself by the hedge." "'What do you let him stay like that for?' said Mrs. Roberts. "'Can I trust you for two minutes together? "'Indeed to goodness, you are all of you more trouble than you are worth.' She went to open the door. "'Johnny! 
Come you in directly, or you will be sorry for it. Johnny! The poor woman called at the door. She went out to the gate and called there. Come you, little Johnny, come you bochin, there's a good boy. I do see you hiding there. She thought he must be hiding in the shadow of the hedge and that he would come across running and laughing. He was always such a happy little fellow to her across the road. But no little merry figure danced out of the gloom of the still dark night. It was all silence. It was then, as the mother's heart began to chill, though she still called cheerfully to the missing child, that the elder boy told how Johnny had said there was something beautiful by the stile, and perhaps he did climb over and he is running now about the meadow and has lost his way. The father got his lantern then, and the whole family went crying and calling about the meadow, promising cakes and sweets and a fine toy to poor Johnny if he would come to them. They found the little body under the ash grove in the middle of the field. He was quite still and dead, so still that a great moth had settled on his forehead, fluttering away when they lifted him up. Dr. Lewis heard this story. There was nothing to be done little to be said to these most unhappy people. "'Take care of the two that you have left to you,' said the doctor as he went away. "'Don't let them out of your sight if you can help it. It is dreadful times that we are living in.' It is curious to record that all through these dreadful times the simple little season went through its accustomed course at Porth. The war and its consequences had somewhat thinned the numbers of the summer visitors. Still, a very fair contingent of them occupied the hotels and boarding-houses and lodging-houses, and bathed from the old-fashioned machines on one beach, or from the new-fashioned tents on the other, and sauntered in the sun, or lay stretched out in the shade under the trees that grow down almost to the water's edge. Porth never tolerated Ethiopians or shows of any kind on its sands, but the Rockets did very well that summer in their garden entertainment, given in the castle grounds, and the fit-up companies that came to the assembly rooms are said to have paid their bills to a woman and to a man. Porth depends very largely on its midland and northern custom, custom of a prosperous, well-established sort. People who think Flandedlow overcrowded and Colwyn Bay too raw and red and new come year after year to the placid old town in the southwest and delight in its peace. And, as I say, they enjoyed themselves much as usual there in the summer of 1915. Now and then they became conscious, as Mr. Merritt became conscious, that they could not wander about quite in the old way but they accepted sentries and coast-watchers and people who politely pointed out the advantages of seeing the view from this point rather than from that as very necessary consequences of the dreadful war that was being waged. Nay, as a Manchester man said, after having been turned back from his favourite walk to Castell Koch, it was gratifying to think that they were so well looked after. "'So far as I can see,' he added, "'there's nothing to prevent a submarine from standing out there by innocent "'and landing half a dozen men in a collapsible boat in any of these little coves. "'And pretty fools we should look, shouldn't we, with our throats cut on the sands, "'or carried back to Germany in the submarine?' "'He tipped the coast-watcher half a crown. "'That's right, lad,' he said. "'You give us the tip.' "'Now,' Here was the strange thing. The North Countryman had his thoughts on elusive submarines and German raiders. The Watcher had simply received instructions to keep the people off Castech Koch fields without reason assigned. And there can be no doubt that the authorities themselves, while they marked out the fields as in the terror zone, gave their orders in the dark and were themselves profoundly in the dark as to the manner of slaughter that had been done there. 
for if they had understood what had happened, they would have understood also that their restrictions were useless. The Manchester man was warned off his walk about ten days after Johnny Roberts' death. The watcher had been placed at his post because, the night before, a young farmer had been found by his wife lying on the grass close to the castle, with no scar on him nor any mark of violence, but stone dead. The wife of the dead man, Joseph Craddock, finding her husband lying motionless on the dewy turf, went white and stricken up the path to the village and got two men who bore the body to the farm. Lewis was sent for, and knew at once when he saw the dead man that he had perished in the way that the little Roberts boy had perished, whatever awful way that might be. Craddock had been asphyxiated, and here again there was no mark of a grip on the throat. It might have been a piece of work by Burke and Hare, the doctor reflected, pitch pastor might have been clapped over the man's mouth and nostrils and held there. Then a thought struck him. His brother-in-law had talked of a new kind of poison gas that was said to be used against the munition workers in the Midlands. Was it possible that the deaths of the man and the boy were due to some such instrument? He applied his tests, but could find no trace of any gas having been employed. Carbonic acid gas? A man could not be killed with that in the open air. To be fatal, that required a confined space, such a position as the bottom of a huge vat or of a well. He did not know how Craddock had been killed. He confessed it to himself. He had been suffocated. That was all he could say. It seemed that the man had gone out at about half-past nine to look after some beasts. The field in which they were was about five minutes' walk from the house. He told his wife he would be back in a quarter of an hour or twenty minutes. He did not return, and when he had been gone for three quarters of an hour, Mrs. Craddock went out to look for him. She went into the field where the beasts were, and everything seemed all right, but there was no trace of Craddock. She called out. There was no answer. Now the meadow in which the cattle were pastured is high ground. A hedge divides it from the fields which fall gently down to the castle and the sea. Mrs. Craddock hardly seemed able to say why, having failed to find her husband among his beasts, she turned to the path which led to Castell Koch. She said at first that she had thought that one of the oxen might have broken through the hedge and strayed, and that Craddock had perhaps gone after it. And then, correcting herself, she said, There was that, and then there was something else that I could not make out at all. It seemed to me that the edge did look different from usual. To be sure, things do look different at night, and there was a bit of sea mist about, but somehow it did look odd to me, and I said to myself, Have I lost my way, then? She declared that the shape of the trees in the hedge appeared to have changed, and besides, it had a look as if it was lighted up somehow. And so she went on towards the stile to see what all this could be, and when she came near everything was as usual. She looked over the stile and called, and hoped to see her husband coming towards her, or to hear his voice, but there was no answer, and glancing down the path she saw, or thought she saw, some sort of brightness on the ground dim sort of light, like a bunch of glow-worms in the edge-bank. And so I climbed over the stile and went down the path, and the light seemed to melt away, and there was my poor husband lying on his back, saying not a word to me when I spoke to him and touched him. So for Lewis the terror blackened, 
and became altogether intolerable, and others, he perceived, felt as he did. He did not know, he never asked, whether the men at the club had heard of these deaths of the child and the young farmer, but no one spoke of them. Indeed, the change was evident. At the beginning of the terror men spoke of nothing else. Now it had become all too awful for ingenious chatter or labored and grotesque theories. And Lewis had received a letter from his brother-in-law at Middlingham. It contained the sentence, "'I am afraid Fanny's health has not greatly benefited by her visit to Porth. There are still several symptoms I don't like at all. And this told him, in a phraseology that the doctor and Merritt had agreed upon, that the terror remained heavy in the Midland town. It was soon after the death of Craddock that people began to tell strange tales of a sound that was to be heard of nights about the hills and valleys to the northward of Porth. A man who had missed the last train from Miros had been forced to tramp ten miles between Miros and Porth, seems to have been the first to hear it. He said he got to the top of a hill by Trendenoch, somewhere between half-past ten and eleven, when he first noticed an odd noise that he could not make out at all. It was like a shout. A long, drawn-out, dismal wail coming from a great way off, faint with distance. He stopped to listen, thinking at first that it might be owls hooting in the woods. But it was different, he said, from that. It was a long cry, and then there was silence, and then it began over again. He could make nothing of it, and feeling frightened, he did not quite know of what. He walked on briskly and was glad to see the lights of Porth Station. He told his wife of this dismal sound that night, and she told the neighbors, and most of them thought it was all fancy, or drink, or the owls after all. But the night after, two or three people who had been to some small merrymaking in a cottage just off the Miros Road heard the sound as they were going home soon after ten. They, too, described it as a long, wailing cry, indescribably dismal in the stillness of the autumn night. "'Like the ghost of a voice,' said one, "'as if it came up from the bottom of the earth,' said another. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 of The Terror. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. The Terror by Arthur Mackin. Chapter 11 at Treff Loin Farm. Let it be remembered again and again that all the while that the terror lasted, there was no common stock of information as to the dreadful things that were being done. The press had not said one word upon it. There was no criterion by which the mass of the people could separate fact from mere vague rumor, no test by which ordinary misadventure or disaster could be distinguished from the achievements of the secret and awful force that was at work and so with every event of the passing day. A harmless commercial traveler might show himself in the course of his business in the tumble-down main street of Miros and find himself regarded with looks of fear and suspicion as a possible worker of murder, while it is likely enough that the true agents of the terror went quite unnoticed. And since the real nature of all this mystery of death was unknown, it followed easily that the signs and warnings and omens of it were all the more unknown. Here was horror. There was horror. But there was no links to join one horror with another, no common basis of knowledge from which the connection between this horror 
and that horror might be inferred so there was no one who suspected at all that this dismal and hollow sound that was now heard of nights in the region to the north of porth had any relation at all to the case of the little girl who went out one afternoon to pick purple flowers and never returned or to the case of the man whose body was taken out of the peaty slime of the marsh or to the case of craddock dead in his fields with a strange glimmering of light about his body as his wife reported and it is a question as to how far the rumor of this melancholy nocturnal summons got abroad at all lewis heard of it as a country doctor hears of most things driving up and down lanes but he heard of it without much interest with no sense that it was in any sort of relation to the terror remnant had been given the story of the hollow and echoing voice of the darkness in a colored and picturesque form he employed a tredonoc man to work in his garden once a week the gardener had not heard the summons himself but he knew a man who had done so thomas jenkins pentoppen he did put his head out late last night to see what the weather was like and he was cutting a field of corn the next day and he did tell me that when he was with the methodists in cardigan he did never hear no singing eloquence in the chapels that was like to it he did declare it was like a wailing of judgment day remnant considered the matter and was inclined to think that the sound must be caused by a subterranean inlet of the sea there might be he supposed an imperfect or half-opened or tortuous blowhole in the tredonoc woods and the noise of the tide surging up below might very well produce that effect of a hollow wailing far away but neither he nor any one else paid much attention to the matter save the few who heard the call at dead of night as it echoed awfully over the black hills the sound had been heard for three or perhaps four nights when the people coming out of tredonoc church after morning service on sunday noticed that there was a big yellow sheep-dog in the churchyard the dog it appeared had been waiting for the congregation for it at once attached itself to them at first to the whole body and then to a group of half a dozen who took the turning to the right two of these presently went off over the fields to their respective houses and four strolled on in the leisurely sunday morning manner of the country and these the dog followed keeping to heel all the time the men were talking hay corn and markets and paid no attention to the animal and so they strolled along the autumn lane till they came to a gate in the hedge whence a roughly made farm road went through the fields and dipped down into the woods and to treff loin farm then the dog became like a possessed creature he barked furiously he ran up to one of the men and looked up at him as if he were begging for his life as the man said and then rushed to the gate and stood by it wagging his tail and barking at intervals the men stared and laughed whose dog will that be said one of them it will be thomas griffith's trefloin said another well then why doesn't he go home go home then he went through the gesture of picking up a stone from the road and throwing it at the dog go home then over the gate with you but the dog never stirred he barked and whined and ran up to the men and then back to the gate at last he came to one of them and crawled and abased himself on the ground and then took hold of the man's coat and tried to pull him in the direction of the gate the farmer shook the dog off and the four went on their way and the dog stood in the road and watched them and then put up its head and uttered a long and dismal howl that was despair the four farmers thought nothing of it sheep dogs in the country are dogs to look after sheep and their whims and fancies are not studied but the yellow dog he was a kind of degenerate collie haunted the tredonoc lanes from that day he came to a cottage door one night and scratched at it and when it was opened lay down 
and then barking ran to the garden gate and waited entreating as it seemed the cottager to follow him they drove him away and again he gave that long howl of anguish it was almost as bad they said as the noise that they had heard a few nights before and then it occurred to somebody so far as i can make out with no particular reference to the odd conduct of the treff loin sheepdog that thomas griffith had not been seen for some time past he had missed market day at porth he had not been seen at tredonoc church where he was a pretty regular attendant on sunday and then as heads were put together it appeared that nobody had seen any of the griffiths family for days and days now in a town even a small town this process of putting heads together is a pretty quick business in the country especially in a countryside of wild lands and scattered and lonely farms and cottages the affair takes time harvest was going on everybody was busy in his own fields and after the long day's hard work neither the farmer nor his men felt inclined to stroll about in search of news or gossip a harvester at the day's end is ready for supper and sleep and for nothing else and so it was late in that week when it was discovered that thomas griffith and all his house had vanished from this world i have often been reproached for my curiosity over questions which are apparently of slight importance or of no importance at all i love to inquire for instance into the question of the visibility of a lighted candle at a distance suppose that is a candle lighted on a still dark night in the country what is the greatest distance at which you can see that there is a light at all and then as to the human voice what is its carrying distance under good conditions as a mere sound apart from any matter of making out words that may be uttered they are trivial questions no doubt but they have always interested me and the latter point has its application to the strange business of treff loin that melancholy and hollow sound that wailing summons that appalled the hearts of those who heard it was indeed a human voice produced in a very exceptional manner and it seems to have been heard at points varying from a mile and a half to two miles from the farm i do not know whether this is anything extraordinary i do not know whether the peculiar method of production was calculated to increase or to diminish the carrying power of the sound again and again i have laid emphasis in this story of the terror on the strange isolation of many of the farms and cottages in marion i have done so in the effort to convince the townsman of something that he has never known to the londoner a house a quarter of a mile from the outlying suburban lamp with no other dwelling within two hundred yards is a lonely house a place to fit with ghosts and mysteries and terrors how can he understand then the true loneliness of the white farmhouses of marion dotted here and there for the most part not even on the little lanes and deep winding byways but set in the very heart of the fields or alone on huge bastioned headlands facing the sea and whether on the high verge of the sea or on the hills or in the hollows of the inner country hidden from the sight of men far from the sound of any common call there is penner hall for example the farm from which the foolish merritt thought he saw signals of light being made from seaward it is of course widely visible but from landward owing partly to the curving and indented configuration of the bay i doubt whether any other habitation views it from a nearer distance than three miles and of all these hidden and remote places i doubt if any is so deeply buried as trefloin i have little or no welch i am sorry to say but i suppose that the name is corrupted from trelwen or tref ilwen the place in the grove and indeed it lies in the very heart of dark overhanging woods a deep narrow valley runs down from the highlands of the alt through these woods through steep hillsides of bracken and gorse right down to the great marsh 
whence merritt saw the dead man being carried the valley lies away from any road even from that by-road little better than a bridle path where the four farmers returning from church were perplexed by the strange antics of the sheep-dog one cannot say that the valley is overlooked even from a distance for so narrow is it that the ash groves that rim it on either side seem to meet and shut it in i at all events have never found any high place from which traff loin is visible though looking down from the alt i have seen blue wood smoke rising from its hidden chimneys such was the place then to which one september afternoon a party went up to discover what had happened to griffith and his family there were a half a dozen farmers a couple of policemen and four soldiers carrying their arms those last had been lent by the officer commanding at the camp lewis too was of the party he had heard by chance that no one knew what had become of griffith and his family and he was anxious about a young fellow a painter of his acquaintance who had been lodging at treff loin all the summer they all met by the gate of tredonoc churchyard and tramped solemnly along the narrow lane all of them i think with some vague discomfort of mind with a certain shadowy fear as of men who do not quite know what they may encounter lewis heard the corporal and the three soldiers arguing over their orders the captain says to me muttered the corporal don't hesitate to shoot if there's any trouble shoot what sir i says the trouble says he and that's all i could get out of him the men grumbled in reply lewis thought he heard some obscure reference to rat poison and wondered what they were talking about they came to the gate in the hedge where the farm road led down to treff loin they followed this track roughly made with grass growing up between its loosely laid stones down by the hedge from field to wood till at last they came to the sudden walls of the valley and the sheltering groves of the ash trees here the way curved down the steep hillside and bent southward and followed henceforward the hidden hollow of the valley under the shadow of the trees here was the farm enclosure the outlying walls of the yard and the barns and sheds and outhouses one of the farmers threw open the gate and walked into the yard and forthwith began bellowing at the top of his voice thomas griffith thomas griffith where be you thomas griffith the rest followed him the corporal snapped out an order over his shoulder and there was a rattling metallic noise as the men fixed their bayonets and became in an instant dreadful dealers out of death in place of harmless fellows with a feeling for beer thomas griffith again bellowed the farmer there was no answer to this summons but they found poor griffith lying on his face at the edge of the pond in the middle of the yard there was a ghastly wound in his side as if a sharp stake had been driven into his body end of chapter eleven chapter twelve of the terror this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by dion gines salt lake city utah the terror by arthur Mackin. chapter twelve the letter of wrath it was a still september afternoon no wind stirred in the hanging woods that were dark all about the ancient house of treff loin the only sound in the dim air was the lowing of the cattle they had wandered it seemed from the fields and had come in by the gate of the farmyard and stood there melancholy as if they mourned for their dead master and the horses four great heavy patient-looking beasts they were there too and in the lower field the sheep were standing as if they waited to be fed you would think they all knew there was something wrong one of the soldiers muttered to another a pale sun showed for a moment and glittered on their bayonets they were standing about the body of poor dead griffith with a certain grimness growing on their faces and hardening there their corporal snapped something at them again they were quite ready 
Lewis knelt down by the dead man and looked closely at the great gaping wound in his side. "'He's been dead a long time,' he said. "'A week, two weeks, perhaps. He was killed by some sharp-pointed weapon. How about the family? How many are there of them? I never attended them.' There was Griffith and his wife, and his son Thomas, and Mary Griffith, his daughter, and I do think there was a gentleman lodging with them this summer. That was from one of the farmers. They all looked at one another, this party of rescue, who knew nothing of the danger that had smitten this house of quiet people, nothing of the peril which had brought them to this pass of a farmyard with a dead man in it and his beasts standing patiently about him, as if they waited for the farmer to rise up and give them their food. Then the party turned to the house. It was an old sixteenth-century building, with the singular round Flemish chimney that is characteristic of Marion. The walls were snowy with whitewash. The windows were deeply set and stone mullioned and a solid stone-tiled porch sheltered the doorway from any winds that might penetrate to the hollow of that hidden valley. The windows were shut tight. There was no sign of any life or movement about the place. The party of men looked at one another, and the church warden amongst the farmers, the sergeant of police, Lewis, and the corporal drew together. "'What is it to goodness, doctor?' said the church warden. I can tell you nothing at all, except that that poor man there has been pierced to the heart, said Lewis. Do you think they are inside, and they will shoot us, said another farmer. He had no notion of what he meant by they, and no one of them knew better than he. They did not know what the danger was, or where it might strike them, or whether it was from without or from within. They stared at the murdered man and gazed dismally at one another. "'Come,' said Lewis, "'we must do something. We must get into the house and see what is wrong.' "'Yes, but suppose they are at us while we are getting in,' said the sergeant. "'Where shall we be then, Dr. Lewis?' The corporal put one of his men by the gate at the top of the farmyard, another at the gate by the bottom of the farmyard, and told them to challenge and shoot. The doctor and the rest opened the little gate of the front garden and went up to the porch and stood listening by the door. It was all dead silence. Lewis took an ash stick from one of the farmers and beat heavily three times on the old black oaken door studded with antique nails. He struck three thundering blows, and then they all waited. There was no answer from within. He beat again, and still silence. He shouted to the people within, but there was no answer. They all turned and looked at one another, that party of quest and rescue, who knew not what they sought, what enemy they were to encounter. There was an iron ring on the door. Lewis turned it, but the door stood fast. It was evidently barred and bolted. The sergeant of police called out to open, but again there was no answer. They consulted together. There was nothing for it but to blow the door open, and some one of them called in a loud voice to anybody that might be within to stand away from the door or they would be killed. And at this very moment the yellow sheepdog came bounding up the yard from the woods and licked their hands and fawned on them and barked joyfully. "'Indeed, now,' said one of the farmers, "'he did know that there was something amiss.' A pity it was, Thomas Williams, that we did not follow him when he implored us last Sunday. The corporal motioned the rest of the party back, and they stood looking fearfully about them at the entrance to the porch. The corporal disengaged his bayonet and shot into the keyhole, calling out once more before he fired. He shot and shot again. So heavy and firm was the ancient door, so stout its bolts and fastenings. At last he had to fire at the massive hinges, and then they all pushed together, and the door lurched open and fell forward. The corporal raised his left hand and stepped back a few paces. He hailed his two men at the top and bottom of the farmyard. They were all right, they said, 
and so the party climbed and struggled over the fallen door into the passage and into the kitchen of the farmhouse young griffith was lying dead before the hearth before a dead fire of white wood ashes they went on towards the parlour and in the doorway of the room was the body of the artist secretan as if he had fallen in trying to get to the kitchen upstairs the two women mrs griffith and her daughter a girl of eighteen were lying together on the bed in the big bedroom clasped in each other's arms they went about the house searched the pantries the back kitchen and the cellars there was no life in it look said dr lewis when they came back to the big kitchen look it is as if they had been besieged do you see that piece of bacon half gnawed through then they found these pieces of bacon cut from the sides of the kitchen wall here and there about the house there was no bread in the place no milk no water and said one of the farmers they had the best water here in all marion the well is down there in the wood it is most famous water the old people did used to call it finan tilo it was saint tilo's well they did say they must have died of thirst said lewis they must have been dead for days and days the group of men stood in the big kitchen and stared at one another a dreadful perplexity in their eyes the dead were all about them within the house and without it and it was in vain to ask why they had died thus the old man had been killed with the piercing thrust of some sharp weapon the rest had perished it seemed probable of thirst but what possible enemy was this that besieged the farm and shut in its inhabitants there was no answer the sergeant of police spoke of getting a cart and taking the bodies into porth and dr lewis went into the parlour that secretan had used as a sitting-room intending to gather any possessions or effects of the dead artist that he might find there half a dozen portfolios were piled up in one corner there were some books on a side table a fishing rod and basket behind the door that seemed all no doubt there would be clothes and such matters upstairs and lewis was about to rejoin the rest of the party in the kitchen when he looked down at some scattered papers lying with the books on the side table on one of the sheets he read to his astonishment the words dr james lewis porth this was written in a staggering trembling scrawl and examining the other leaves he saw that they were covered with writing the table stood in a dark corner of the room and lewis gathered up the sheets of paper and took them to the window ledge and began to read amazed at certain phrases that had caught his eye but the manuscript was in disorder as if the dead man who had written it had not been equal to the task of gathering the leaves into their proper sequence it was some time before the doctor had each page in its place this was the statement that he read with ever-growing wonder while a couple of the farmers were harnessing one of the horses in the yard to a cart and the others were bringing down the dead women i do not think that i can last much longer we shared out the last drops of water a long time ago i do not know how many days ago we fall asleep and dream and walk about the house in our dreams and i am often not sure whether i am awake or still dreaming and so the days and nights are confused in my mind i awoke not long ago at least i suppose i awoke and found i was lying in the passage i had a confused feeling that i had had an awful dream which seemed horribly real and i thought for a moment what a relief it was to know that it wasn't true whatever it might have been i made up my mind to have a good long walk to refresh myself up and then i looked around and found that i had been lying on the stones of the passage and it all came back to me there was no walk for me i have not seen mrs griffith or her daughter for a long time they said they were going upstairs to have a rest i heard them moving about the room at first now i can hear nothing young griffith is lying in the kitchen before the hearth he was talking to himself about the harvest and the weather when i last went into the kitchen 
He didn't seem to know I was there, as he went gabbling on in a low voice very fast, and then he began to call the dog Tiger. There seems no hope for any of us. We are in the dream of death. Here the manuscript became unintelligible for half a dozen lines. Secretan had written the words, Dream of Death, three or four times over. He had begun a fresh word, and had scratched it out, and then followed strange, unmeaning characters, the script, as Lewis thought, of a terrible language. And then the writing became clear, clearer than it was at the beginning of the manuscript, and the sentences flowed more easily, as if the cloud on Secretan's mind had lifted for a while. There was a fresh start, as it were, and the writer began again, in ordinary letter form. Dear Lewis, I hope you will excuse all this confusion and wandering. I intended to begin a proper letter to you, and now I find all that stuff that you have been reading, if this ever gets into your hands. I have not the energy even to tear it up. If you read it, you will know to what a sad pass I had come when it was written. It looks like delirium or a bad dream, and even now, though my mind seems to have cleared up a good deal, I have to hold myself in tightly to be sure that the experiences of the last days in this awful place are true, real things, not a long nightmare from which I shall wake up presently and find myself in my rooms at Chelsea. I have said of what I am writing, if it ever gets into your hands, and I am not at all sure that it ever will. If what is happening here is happening everywhere else, then I suppose the world is coming to an end. I cannot understand it. Even now I can hardly believe it. I know that I dream such wild dreams and walk in such mad fancies that I have to look out and look about me to make sure that I am not still dreaming. Do you remember that talk we had about two months ago when I dined with you? We got on, somehow or other, to space and time, and I think we agreed that as soon as one tried to reason about space and time, one was landed in a maze of contradictions. You said something to the effect that it was very curious, but this was just like a dream. A man will sometimes wake himself from his crazy dream, you said, by realizing that he is thinking nonsense and we both wondered whether these contradictions that one can't avoid if one begins to think of time and space may not really be proofs that the whole of life is a dream, and the moon and the stars bits of nightmare. I have often thought over that lately. I kick at the walls, as Dr. Johnson kicked at the stone, to make sure that the things about me are there. And then that other question gets into my mind— is the world really coming to an end, the world as we have always known it? And what on earth will this new world be like? I can't imagine it. It's a story like Noah's Ark and the Flood. People used to talk about the end of the world and fire, but no one ever thought of anything like this. And then there's another thing that bothers me. Now and then I wonder whether we are not all mad together in this house, in spite of what I see and know, or perhaps I should say, because what I see and know is so impossible, I wonder whether we are not all suffering from a delusion. Perhaps we are our own jailers, and we are really free to go out and live. Perhaps what we think we see is not there at all. I believe I have heard of whole families going mad together, and I may have come under the influence of the house, having lived in it for the last four months. I know there have been people who have been kept alive by their keepers, forcing food down their throats, because they are quite sure that their throats are closed, so that they feel they are unable to swallow a morsel. I wonder now and then whether we are all like this in Treff Loin. Yet in my heart I feel sure that it is not so. Still, I do not want to leave a madman's letter behind me, and so I will not tell you the full story of what I have seen, or believe I have seen. If I am a sane man, you will be able to fill in the blanks for yourself from your own knowledge. If I am mad, burn the letter and say nothing about it. 
or perhaps and indeed i am not quite sure i may wake up and hear mary griffith calling to me in her cheerful sing-song that breakfast will be ready directly in a minute and i shall enjoy it and walk over to porth and tell you the queerest most horrible dream that a man ever had and ask what i had better take i think that it was on a tuesday that we first noticed that there was something queer about only at the time we didn't know that there was anything really queer in what we noticed i had been out since nine o'clock in the morning trying to paint the marsh and i found it a very tough job i came home about five or six o'clock and found the family at trefloin laughing at old tiger the sheepdog he was making short runs from the farmyard to the door of the house barking with quick short yelps mrs griffith and miss griffith were standing by the porch and the dog would go to them look in their faces and then run up the farmyard to the gate and then look back with that eager yelping bark as if he were waiting for the women to follow him then again and again he ran up to them and tugged at their skirts as if he would pull them by main force away from the house then the men came home from the fields and he repeated this performance the dog was running all up and down the farmyard in and out of the barn and sheds yelping barking and always with that eager run to the person he addressed and running away directly and looking back as if to see whether we were following him when the house door was shut and they all sat down to supper he would give them no peace till at last they turned him out of doors and then he sat in the porch and scratched at the door with his claws barking all the while when the daughter brought in my meal she said we can't think what has come to old tiger and indeed he has always been a good dog too the dog barked and yelped and whined and scratched at the door all through the evening they let him in once but he seemed to have become quite frantic he ran up to one member of the family after another his eyes were bloodshot and his mouth was foaming and he tore at their clothes till they drove him out again into the darkness then he broke into a long lamentable howl of anguish and we heard no more of him end of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of the terror this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. The Terror by Arthur Mackin. Chapter 13. The Last Words of Mr. Secretan. I slept ill that night. I awoke again and again from uneasy M dreams, and I seemed in my sleep to hear strange calls and noises and a sound of murmurs and beatings on the door. There were deep, hollow voices, too, that echoed in my sleep, and when I woke I could hear the autumn wind, mournful, on the hills above us. I started up once with a dreadful scream in my ears, but then the house was all still, and I fell again into uneasy sleep. It was soon after dawn when I finally roused myself. The people in the house were talking to each other in high voices, arguing about something that I did not understand. "'It is those damned gypsies, I tell you,' said old Griffith. "'What would they do a thing like that for?' asked Mrs. Griffith. "'If it was stealing now.' "'It is more likely that John Jenkins has done it out of spite,' said the son. "'He said that he would remember you when we did catch him poaching.' "'They seemed puzzled and angry, so far as I could make out, but not at all frightened. "'I got up and began to dress.' I don't think I looked out of the window. The glass on my dressing-table is high and broad, and the window is small. One would have to poke one's head around the glass to see anything. The voices were still arguing downstairs. I heard the old man say, Well, here's for a beginning, anyhow. And then the door slammed. A minute later the old man shouted, I think, to his son. Then there was a great noise which I will not describe more particularly, and a dreadful screaming, 
and crying inside the house, and a sound of rushing feet. They all cried out at once to each other. I heard the daughter crying, It is no good, mother. He is dead. Indeed, they have killed him. And Mrs. Griffith screaming to the girl to let her go. And then one of them rushed out of the kitchen and shot the great bolts of oak across the door, just as something beat against it with a thundering crash. I ran downstairs. I found them all in wild confusion, in an agony of grief and horror and amazement. They were like people who had seen something so awful that they had gone mad. I went to the window, looking out on the farmyard. I won't tell you all that I saw, but I saw poor old Griffith lying by the pond with the blood pouring out of his side. I wanted to go out to him and bring him in, but they told me that he must be stone dead, and such things also, that it was quite plain that any one who went out of the house would not live more than a moment. We could not believe it, even as we gazed at the body of the dead man, but it was there. I used to wonder sometimes what one would feel like if one saw an apple drop from the tree and shoot up into the air and disappear. I think I know now how one would feel. Even then, we couldn't believe that it would last. We were not seriously afraid for ourselves. We spoke of getting out in an hour or two, before dinner anyhow. It couldn't last, because it was impossible. Indeed, at twelve o'clock, young Griffith said he would go down to the well by the back way and draw another pail of water. I went to the door and stood by it. He had not gone a dozen yards before they were on him. He ran for his life, and we had all we could do to bar the door in time. And then I began to get frightened. Still we could not believe in it. Somebody would come along shouting in an hour or two, and it would all melt away and vanish. There could not be any real danger. There was plenty of bacon in the house, and half the weekly baking of loaves, and some beer in the cellar, and a pound or two of tea, and a whole pitcher of water that had been drawn from the well the night before. We could do all right for the day, and in the morning it would have all gone away. But day followed day, and it was still there. I knew Treff Loin was a lonely place. That was why I had gone there, to have a long rest from all the jangle and rattle and turmoil of London that makes a man alive and kills him too. I went to Trefloin because it was buried in the narrow valley under the ash trees, far away from any track. There was not so much as a footpath that was near it. No one ever came that way. Young Griffith had told me that it was a mile and a half to the nearest house, and the thought of the silent peace and retirement of the farm used to be a delight to me. And now this thought came back without delight, with terror. Griffith thought that a shout might be heard on a still night up away on the alt, if a man was listening for it, he added doubtfully. My voice was clearer and stronger than his, and on the second night I said I would go up to my bedroom and call for help through the open window. I waited till it was all dark and still and looked out through the window before opening it, and then I saw over the ridge of the long barn across the yard what looked like a tree, though I knew there was no tree there. It was a dark mass against the sky, with widespread boughs, a tree of thick, dense growth. I wondered what this could be, and I threw open the window, not only because I was going to call for help, but because I wanted to see more clearly what the dark growth over the barn really was. I saw in the depth of the dark of it points of fire and colors in light, all glowing and moving, and the air trembled. I stared out into the night, and the dark tree lifted over the roof of the barn and rose up in the air and floated towards me. I did not move till at the last moment when it was close to the house, and then I saw what it was and banged the window down only just in time. I had to fight, and I saw the tree that was like a burning cloud rise up in the night and sink again 
and settle over the barn. I told them downstairs of this. They sat with white faces. And Mrs. Griffith said that ancient devils were let loose and had come out of the trees and out of the old hills because of the wickedness that was on the earth. She began to murmur something to herself, something that sounded to me like broken-down Latin. I went up to my room again an hour later, but the dark tree swelled over the barn. Another day went by, and at dusk I looked out, but the eyes of the fire were watching me. I dared not open the window. And then I thought of another plan. There was the great old fireplace with the round Flemish chimney going high above the house. If I stood beneath it and shouted, I thought perhaps the sound might be carried better than if I called out of the window. For all I know, the round chimney might act as a sort of megaphone. Night after night, then, I stood in the hearth and called for help from nine o'clock to eleven. I thought of the lonely place, deep in the valley of the ash trees, of the lonely hills and lands about it. I thought of the little cottages far away, and hoped that my voice might reach to those within them. I thought of the winding lane high on the alt, and of the few men that came there of nights, but I hoped that my cry might come to one of them. But we had drunk up the beer, and we would only let ourselves have water by little drops, and on the fourth night my throat was dry, and I began to feel strange and weak. I knew that all the voice I had in my lungs would hardly reach the length of the field by the farm. It was then we began to dream of wells and fountains, and water coming very cold, in little drops, out of rocky places in the middle of a cool wood. We had given up all meals. Now and then one would cut a lump from the sides of bacon on the kitchen wall and chew a bit of it, but the saltiness was like fire. There was a great shower of rain one night. The girl said we might open a window and hold out bowls and basins and catch the rain. I spoke of the cloud with burning eyes. She said, We will go to the window in the dairy at the back, and one of us can get some water at all events. She stood up with her basin on the stone slab in the dairy and looked out and heard the splashing of the rain falling very fast and she unfastened the catch of the window and had just opened it gently with one hand for about an inch and had her basin in the other hand. And then, said she, there was something that began to tremble and shudder and shake as it did when we went to the choral festival at St. Tielo's. And the organ played, and there was the cloud and the burning close before me. And then we began to dream, as I say, I woke up in my sitting-room one hot afternoon when the sun was shining, and I had been looking and searching in my dream all through the house, and I had gone down to the old cellar that wasn't used, the cellar with the pillars and the vaulted room, with an iron pike in my hand. Something said to me that there was water there, and in my dream I went to a heavy stone by the middle pillar and raised it up and there beneath was a bubbling well of cold, clear water, and I had just hollowed my hand to drink it when I woke. I went into the kitchen and told young Griffith. I said I was sure there was water there. He shook his head, but he took up the great kitchen poker, and we went down to the old cellar. I showed him the stone by the pillar, and he raised it up, but there was no well. Do you know I reminded myself of many people whom I have met in life? I would not be convinced. I was sure that, after all, there was a well there. They had a butcher's cleaver in the kitchen, and I took it down to the old cellar and hacked at the ground with it. The others didn't interfere with me. We were getting past that. We hardly ever spoke to one another. Each one would be wandering about the house, upstairs and downstairs, each one of us, I suppose, bent on his own foolish plan and mad design, but we hardly ever spoke. Years ago I was an actor for a bit, and I remember how it was on first nights, the actors treading softly up and down the wings, by their entrance, their lips moving and muttering over the words of their parts, but without a word for one another. So it was with us. 
I came upon young Griffith one evening, evidently trying to make a subterranean passage under one of the walls of the house. I knew he was mad, as he knew I was mad when he saw me digging for a well in the cellar. But neither said anything to the other. Now we are past all this. We are too weak. We dream when we are awake, and when we dream we think we wake. Night and day come and go, and we mistake one for another. I hear Griffith murmuring to himself about the stars when the sun is high at noonday, and at midnight I have found myself thinking that I walked in bright sunlit meadows beside cold rushing streams that flowed from high rocks. Then at the dawn figures in black robes carrying lighted tapers in their hands pass slowly about and about and I hear great rolling organ music that sounds as if some tremendous rite were to begin, and voices crying in an ancient song shrill from the depths of the earth. Only a little while ago I heard a voice which sounded as if it were at my very ears, but rang and echoed and resounded as if it were rolling and reverberated from the vault of some cathedral, chanting in terrible modulations. I heard the words quite clearly. Incipit liber ire domini de nostri. Here beginneth the book of the wrath of the Lord our God. And then the voice sang the word, Aleph, prolonging it, it seemed through ages, and a light was extinguished as it began the chapter. In that day, saith the Lord, there shall be a cloud over the land, and in the cloud a burning, and a shape of fire and out of the cloud shall issue forth my messengers. They shall run all together, they shall not turn aside. This shall be a day of exceeding bitterness, without salvation. And on every high hill, saith the Lord of hosts, I will set my sentinels, and my armies shall encamp in the place of every valley. In the house that is amongst rushes I will execute judgment, and in vain shall they fly for refuge, to the munitions of the rocks. In the groves of the trees, in the places where the leaves are as a tent above them, they shall find the sword of the slayer, and they that put their trust in walled cities shall be confounded. Woe unto the armed man! Woe unto him that taketh pleasure in the strength of his artillery! For a little thing shall smite him, and by one that hath no might shall he be brought down into the dust. That which is low shall be set on high. I will make the lamb and the young sheep to be as the lion from the swellings of Jordan. They shall not spare, saith the Lord, and the doves shall be as eagles on the hill and getty. None shall be found that may abide the onset of their battle. Even now I can hear the voice rolling far away, as if it came from the altar of a great church and I stood at the door. There are lights very far away in the hollow of a vast darkness, and one by one they are put out. I hear a voice chanting again with that endless modulation that climbs and aspires to the stars and shines there and rushes down to the dark depths of the earth again to ascend. The word is Zane. Here the manuscript lapsed again, and finally into utter lamentable confusion. There were scrawled lines wavering across the page on which Secretan seemed to have been trying to note the unearthly music that swelled in his dying ears. As the scrapes and scratches of ink showed, he had tried hard to begin a new sentence. The pen had dropped at last out of his hand upon the paper, leaving a blot and a smear upon it. Lewis heard the tramp of feet along the passage. They were carrying out the dead to the cart. End of chapter 13